is entitled Why Church. We're discussing some of the purposes of coming to church and being a part of the church and understanding what the church is. One of the major things that sets the church apart is what it believes and has to say about the person Jesus Christ. And to us, he was more than a historical figure. He was more than a good teacher. He was more than a man. He was the Christ, the son of the living God. I'm going to talk more about that today in a sermon that I've entitled The Divine Revelation. The Divine Revelation. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Matthew. The 16th chapter. Verse 13, we've been in this passage for a few weeks now. There's so much in it. Begin reading at the 13th verse, the New American Standard Bible. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah but still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Join me for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this time which we sit to hear and to heed and to take in your holy word. We pray your grace on our understanding, your grace on our ears, your grace on our lips. We pray your grace throughout this message. We ask that you would have your way, that your word would be exalted. And we thank you, Lord, for giving us a heart to heed it and its instruction. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to quote John MacArthur. as he responded to a statement made by L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology, who claims that Jesus never existed as a person, but rather was an electronic idea that was implanted by the true powers of the universe into the mind of someone between incarnations about 600 BC. After calling these comments bizarre, blasphemous, and stunning, MacArthur added this also in response. And yet, if you reject the true Christ, you can concoct any Christ you want 
and you're going to end up in the same place. The effect of missing the truth about Jesus Christ is the same. You can pick your poison, you can pick your religion, but anything other than believing in the true Christ is damning belief. The right understanding of Jesus Christ is essential to the gospel and to salvation. John is right. It is a belief in the true Christ and all that he claimed to be that lands the sinner in salvation. Any deviation from it even in what may appear to be the slightest difference, can keep separate a soul from God for all eternity. So paramount is the understanding of Christ and who he truly is that Jesus said that his entire church, the assembly of God, would be built on this understanding. The revelation of who he is. Matthew chapter 16 verse 18, Jesus says, upon this rock, the rock of the revelation that Peter had, I will build my church. In other words, Jesus said, Peter, upon the rock of the divine revelation and understanding you have of who I am, I'm going to build my church. So the church, the assembly of the called out of God, we know that the church is not just, is not the building, it's the, it's the called out ones that occupy it. That church, this church, is established foundationally on a sound biblical Christology. Jesus said that it is upon proper understanding of who I am that I will build my church. It's built on a proper understanding of who Christ is. That's its foundation, centered around Christ and who he is. The basis for the church is a true understanding of who Christ is. All other false religions in one way or another have a misguided view explaining who Christ is and therein lies their fault. It is only by faith in a true understanding of who Jesus Christ is that man is reconciled to God for salvation. So let's look more intently at this whole conversation. First off, Jesus begins by asking a very simple question. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? It's not by chance that it's notated that they came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. Barclay in his commentary writes that Caesarea Philippi was an area associated with idols and rival deities. It was known for being a place with various religions, much like America has become today. He goes on to say, it is as if Jesus deliberately set himself against the background of the world's religions in all their history, in all their splendor, and demanded to be compared to them and to have the verdict given in his favor. It's almost as if he intentionally set himself up against the backdrop of all of these different religions. And asked his disciples, in the midst of all of this, all these other gods, all these false gods, who do people say I am? Yeah. 
Today, we live in a society that embraces all sorts of religious systems and beliefs. Everything from paganism, deism, atheism, polytheism, and there are even other monotheistic faiths like ours that are yet still miles away from Christianity. We even have spinoffs to Christianity that deviate at the point of this very question, who is Jesus? But the slightest deviation makes a world of a difference. Your response to that, your response to that question makes a world of a difference. Who is Jesus? Who do men say that I am? Who do these others say that I am? And if you listen to what the other religions of the world believe and have to say, almost all of them have something to say about Jesus. The question is, is it right? There's the fork. Christ is such a powerful figure. The things that he said and did were of such significance that his contribution to the world could never be ignored, even if they wanted. He must be addressed. He was so big in 33 years that even if you don't believe in him, you must give an account for why. He can't be ignored. You have to address this Jesus character. This was true even in biblical times. While he was alive, there was so much buzz about him that people were talking, some in belief, others in disbelief. But everyone had something to say, and everyone had to say something. From the governor pilot to the beggar on the road, everyone had to answer the question, who is Jesus? Who is he? And even today, everyone, every one of us, everyone in the world must deal with that same question. Who is this Jesus guy? The world must answer the question, who is Jesus? And the church must answer it. The church must answer it. The church is here to answer it. And the disciples shared some of what others were saying in verse 14 in in Jesus' day. And look what they said. They said, some say that you're John the Baptist. This is what some people are saying. Others are saying that you're Elijah. But still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Look at the mixed reviews. So many people saying so many different things. And isn't that like it is today? So many different takes, perspectives, and views on Jesus. I want you to notice, however, that none of these others were accurate. Or completely accurate, I should say. The same, again, is true in this generation. If you want to know who Jesus is, you cannot make the fatal error of heeding the ungrounded opinions and explanations uttered by the mouths of men alone. Especially unbelieving ones. What he says And what she says is not always the best way to get an understanding about anything. So what do we do? We go to the Bible. The Bible is a divine book. That means that you have to have faith, don't you? You have to believe that God is. He who comes to God must first believe that he is. That he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You have to have some measure of faith. And we have chosen to place our faith in this divine book and its author. It's been preserved by God through history. Despite the demonic attempts 
to destroy it over the years. It is God's word. It is infallible. It is inerrant. It reveals who Jesus is. And it's not any man's take on Jesus. It is God's take on who Jesus is. You see, God wants us to know who this figure in history, Jesus, is. And so many wonder. And in wondering, end up listening to the words of men and their opinions. But why not listen to the word of God instead? I know what you're thinking. Does that mean that we can't believe what anyone says? No, that's not what I'm saying. Let me clarify. If a person is speaking biblically, they're not just giving their opinion then or the opinions of men. They are telling you what God's word says and therefore can be considered credible so long as they are interpreting the Bible correctly. So it's not about what others have to say about Jesus. And that was Jesus' point to the question, who do other people say that I am? To point out that all these other views are misguided and wrong. It's not about what other people say. It's about who God says Jesus is. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 16 through 17, he points this out when Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. There it is. There's the truth. That's who he is. But look what Jesus says in response to that. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Amen. You know what he said, Peter? You didn't get this from he say, she say. You got this from God. Our understanding of who God is comes from God. Our understanding of who Jesus is comes from God. He said, Peter, what you just said can be trusted. You said it, Peter. You are a man. You said it, but it can be trusted because what you just said about me came from God and not man. Anytime someone speaks in line with God, how do you speak in line with God? When you line up with his word. Anytime someone speaks in line with God's word, the individual's words can be trusted. What the church believes about Jesus Christ is based on what God himself has revealed by his word about Jesus Christ. We believe what the Bible says about Jesus. It's not based on the fallible ideologies of mere men. Now I want to hover hover over this revelation that Peter had about who Jesus was with a magnifying glass, if you will. And look at this revelation that Jesus himself so positively and certainly affirmed. He affirmed what Peter said. And this is, yes, Peter, you've got it. Matthew chapter 16. Again, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Again, Jesus affirms this statement. He doesn't deny it. He doesn't alter it. He doesn't modify it at all. He himself affirms that he is the Christ. By the way, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Jesus Christ. Christ is a title. 
It's an office. Jesus the Christ. He affirms that he is the Christ, that he is the son of the living God, and that's who he is. Now, the theology in this short statement here is amazing. In 10 words, Peter speaks certain truths about Jesus that distinguish what Christians believe from a whole gamut of other beliefs. Here is the fork in the road that leads to two distinct destinations, heaven or hell. Who men say that he is and who does God say that he is and therefore who does the church say that he is? First, Jesus asks, who do men say that I am? Then he asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And that's when Peter speaks up and says, you are the Christ. So what the church has to say about Christ differs from what others have to say about Christ. It's what makes this body distinct. It's what makes the ecclesia, the assembly of God, different. Is who we say Jesus is. We believe in accordance to the Bible and his divine revelation and this divine revelation that Peter had that Christ himself strongly affirmed that he is the Christ, that he is the son of the living God. And we, the true church and church and all who make it up, rest our faith on the footing of this foundational truth right here. You look over other religions, and this is the one major difference that divides us. These 10 words make a world of a difference. Let's look at what Peter said. Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. Peter answered and said, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. I thought a while about how to deliver this point to you today, and I knew that I didn't have time to get into all the theology involved in this statement, and there's a lot. But let me just say this. By saying that Jesus was the Christ, Peter, in a nutshell, had just declared that Jesus was the Savior. See, the Christ to the Jewish people, in short summary, was the long-awaited king. He was to be a son of David, expected to be the savior and deliverer of their nation and the author of their highest felicity. That's who he was. Matthew chapter 21, verse 9, when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem before he was crucified... The crowds, they went ahead of him, and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. They knew who the Messiah was to be. They knew what prophecy said about the Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna means, oh, save. They were saying, save us. Why? Because they knew that the Messiah was to be a savior. They understood that the Christ was a savior. But they misunderstood the way in which he intended to save them. They thought from Rome's kingdom. They thought from the kingdoms of man. But as we now know, it was from Satan's kingdom. The kingdom of darkness. He came to deliver us from eternal separation from God in hell. The word Christ in the Greek means anointed. It's used in the Septuagint, the Greek uh, Old Testament, hundreds of times. It was uh, the Greek interpretation of the Hebrew word Messiah. Christ Messiah, same thing. And the word was used other times in scripture to refer to someone or someone's 
who were anointed in semblance of being divinely appointed by God for a work. Kings, prophets, priests were all, quote unquote, messiahs anointed. But Jesus was not just a messiah or a Christ. He was the messiah, the anointed one. He was the Christ and the Jews understood the difference. Old Testament prophecy was clear that there was a distinct figure who would come as the Messiah. Not just someone who was anointed for a special work, but the anointed one. And that's who Christ was. He was the Messiah. He was the Christ. He is a culmination of all the previously anointed offices in the Old Testament. The offices of priest, prophet, king. He is the zenith of every one of those mediating offices. And he now perfectly serves as mediator between God and man as our deliverer, our savior. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, but as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which he has enacted on better promises, referring to Christ, our high priest, our high priest, our, he's our prophet, he is our king. His miraculous ministry on earth filled with teachings as The prophetic voice in which he spoke as the mouth of God, that's prophet. His sacrifice on the cross on behalf of humanity in which he offered himself up as both the offerer and the offering for the sins of man, paving the way for man to be reconciled to God and therefore inherit salvation. That's our priest, our high priest. His resurrection from the dead and semblance of his conquering heroics over sin and death and over all the power of the enemy, that's his kingship. He is the consummation and final expression of all that God was showing us in the Old Testament. It all pointed to him. The priests, the prophets, and the kings were all just interims holding the seat until the Messiah, until the Christ showed up, Jesus, our Lord. And as our Messiah, as the Christ, as Peter declared, you are the Christ He serves as our high priest. He serves as our mediator. He mediates on our behalf to God. As prophet, he mediates on God's behalf to us. As king, he mediates the rule of God over man, Lord and King. So when Peter says, you are the Christ, he's saying, you are this person, this long-awaited anointed son of David who would operate as prophet, priest, and king, delivering us to salvation. That's what he said. You are the Christ. That's who he is to us. Uh, To the world, that's who he is to us. That's who he is to the church. He is our Christ. Judaism, as it did then, so it does now, still operating under the old covenant, specifically the Torah, rejects that Jesus was the anticipated Messiah. They rejected him then, they reject him now. They still look to the coming of a Messiah. They look for a future redeemer. John 1 and 11 says that he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. And to various other religions, Jesus is not the Christ. He is not 
their savior. He is not the mediator between God and man and man to God. He isn't the way or the only way to God in heaven. He's many things to them, but he is not that. But to the church, he is. Many of the other religions don't even have faith in salvation by a divine aid. Salvation ranges in other religions from a belief in the effects of some sort of ritualistic magic or in initiation ceremonies. Others boast of salvation by self-effort or on the basis of good works. That salvation is achieved through human effort. This is usually through the acquisition of esoteric knowledge, aesthetic discipline, or even heroic death. But never outside of orthodox Christianity is Christ extending salvation by grace based on his finished work on the cross on our behalf. Orthodox Christianity stands alone in this regard. To us, he is the Christ. He's the Christ. And while there is another major religion, Islam, that claims to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, is certainly not in the same sense that we understand it and have just explained. They and others yet still differ, not only here, but on the second part of Peter's statement, which was... You are not only the Christ, but you're the son of the living God. It always confused me to hear other religions call Jesus a good teacher. To them, he's just a good teacher, a prophet with good things to say. It confused me to hear them call him a good teacher while rejecting his divinity and that he was Messiah. If he was neither of these or even just one of these, that makes him not a good teacher but a madman. See, he's claiming to be God. If he's not all the way true, then he's crazy. So they endorse him, but deny him. What a paradox. But Peter said, you are the son of the living God, which means you are not just the Messiah, but you are also equal and of the same essence as God. You are a divine being. You are not just man. You are man, but you are also God. You were, as John chapter 1 verse 1 says, the word that was with God in the beginning and the word that was not only with God, but the word that was God. Which in Christianity is what qualified him to be our Savior. his impeccable life, his divinity, the fact that he was apart from sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There was an exchange on the cross. His perfect moral standard in exchange for our sin field depravity no one else had he been a man would have been qualified revelations chapter 5 verse 12 in a loud voice they were saying worthy is the lamb who was slain the lamb had to be worthy of being the sacrifice You see, God showed us in the Old Testament that the sacrifice for sin had to be worthy. That meant that it had to be perfect. It had to be without sin. And the way that he showed this in foreshadowing is he required that the lamb be without spot or blemish. 
They had to examine it for days to make sure that this lamb that was offered as a sin offering to atone for the sins of the people, it was a perfect lamb. And he was showing us then Christ, the Son of God, apart from sin, who would be offered in, on our behalf. It was, if Christ was not divine, he was sinfully blemished like every other ordinary man. If he was just a man and not God, his sacrifice is insufficient. Anything short of perfection was insufficient. So the church declares that he wasn't just the Messiah, he was, the, he was God, he was divine. The church is founded on the revelation that he was fully man and fully God all at the same time. That he is the second person of the Trinity, the incarnation of God, the Son of God, and the Savior. John chapter 5 verse 18, for this reason therefore the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. He claimed to be equal with God. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, for in Christ, in Christ, in Jesus, all the fullness of deity, all the fullness of God lives in bodily form. He was fully God. Did you know that Buddhism, Islam, Unitarian, Universalism, Mormonism, Baha'i, faith, and Christian science, and many others all believe that Jesus was just a man? According to a study conducted by the Barna Group, 44% of all adults in America either are unsure or believe that Jesus was only a religious spiritual leader and not divine. 44%. When broken down by generations, 38% elders, 42% bloomers, 46% Gen Xers, but 52% of millennials either don't know or are unsure or don't believe that Jesus was God. And if you notice, the percentage climbs with each generation. If we continue at that rate, within 10 generations, America will be completely lost. Islam rejects the divinity of Jesus and teaches that Jesus was not God incarnate nor the son of God. And according to some interpretations of the Quran, the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection is not believed to have even occurred and rather that God saved him. Mainstream Muslims believe that Jesus not only uh, did not physically die, but was instead raised alive to heaven. A little bit of the truth with a little bit of the lie. Jehovah's Witnesses, I just want to add this as a footnote, believe that Jesus Christ was a created, was created. He was a created son of God and therefore not equal with God, not a part of the Trinity. We differ at the point of Christ. But if Jesus was not the son of God and sinlessly divine by nature, he could never be our savior. And I'm done with this. So what's the church's responsibility in all this? Well, after this powerful dialogue that we see in Matthew, the 16th chapter, in the 20th verse, after Peter makes this declaration and, God, and, and Jesus says, I'm going to build my church on this understanding. My church is going to, uh, to stand on this footing this is what's going to make my church different from everyone else, my assembly. Then he warns the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. <laughs> Why would he do that? Very important to understand that. 
The reason why he told them not to tell anyone he was the Christ is because they needed to understand what all that meant first. Peter knew that he was the Messiah, that he was the son of God, but he did not know what it meant for Christ to be the Messiah, the son of the living God. If they had perpetuated the message at that time, it would have been in misunderstanding under the understanding that everyone else had about the Christ at the time. Christ had to fulfill all of scripture. He had to die and be resurrected to bring them to the fullness of the revelation of what it meant for him to be the Christ, the son of the living God. And then when the lesson is complete, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There's the Trinity there. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So the instructions then were not the instructions later because they needed to fully understand what it all meant. So Jesus said, hold the thought. Let me finish giving you understanding of what it is that I'm saying. Once they had it, now go. So now, not then, now the church has been greatly commissioned to take this message that he is both Christ, Messiah, and the son of the living God to the world. On a wall near the main entrance to the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, is a portrait with the following inscription. James Butler Bonham no picture of him exists. This is what the inscription says. This portrait of his nephew, Major James Bonham, deceased, who greatly resembled his uncle. It is placed here by the family that people may know the appearance of the man who died for their freedom. No literal portrait of Jesus exists either. But the likeness of the son who makes us free can be seen in the lives of his true followers. As Bill Morgan you see, it is the church's responsibility to perpetuate this revelation that Peter had. To not only believe it and to understand it, but to share it. It's the revelation that serves as our foundation and the revelation that makes us relevant and remarkably different from any other religious assembly. As with the portrait in Alamo, in the Alamo, in place of a portrait of James Bonham, the church has been placed on the hallways of the world to point those passing by wondering who Jesus was to the revelation of who Jesus is. And what an awesome task that is to show the world our Savior. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes?